We're good to start? Awesome. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much. All right, everyone. Thanks for bearing with us. Sorry about the AV issues. Um, we've got our next talk here is by Rose Borer, who's an assistant professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And she's going to be talking about mental health mentoring for PL students. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Rose. All right, hello, thank you for having me and thank you for vigorously rebooting the computer as much as necessary. So I know we're getting a bit of a late start, so I'm gonna go right into it. Um, so, um, outline of the talk, I'm going to talk about who I am and am not, uh, what the talk is and is not. Uh, we're going to start with some of the, kind of the basic fundamental facts about mental health in grad school. And then we're going to get a little bit more technical. Um, we'll talk about some of the dominant models that people use to talk about mental health and the different things that influence it and the different things you can do. Uh, and then we'll close with stuff that's a little bit more action oriented. So um, before I get into the depth of the talk, um, this is the kind of thing that needs a content warning. Um, so obviously in a mental health talk, we're gonna talk about a bunch of different sensitive things. We are going to talk about self-harm, suicidal ideation, um, statistics on suicide rates in different communities. There's not going to be anything gory, not going to be anything graphic. Uh, we are going to talk about different kinds of social inequality and how they can create unique mental health problems for different groups. So we are going to be talking about racism, xenophobia, queerphobia, ableism, those sorts of things. Um, if you wish to exclude, excuse yourself, take any kind of breaks for your well-being at any time, uh, please do. It would be against the interest of a mental health talk uh, if we did not do that. Okay, so let's get into some of the content. Who am I and you know why am I the one that's here speaking today? So to put it at simplest, I am somebody in your own community, the programming languages research community, uh, who has lived through a lot of mental health things. So to give you a sense of some of the different diagnoses I either have or have had, um, we're talking mood disorders like major depression, generalized anxiety, social anxiety. I'm also neuro neurodivergent. So I am autistic and also have ADHD. And all of these things play into mental health. I also have other identities and life experiences that often intersect with mental health issues. So I have a physical disability, specifically Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Uh, and I'm also transgender, and there are a lot of very unique mental health issues that come up within those communities. When I was a grad student, I was on the board for a group called Here For You, which was at CMU, um, a student mental health advocacy org. So I learned some things through that. I've also stayed active uh, in different ways at WPI. So I have participated in groups that do kind of peer-to-peer discussion about how to support students with mental health things, and simply from talking a lot with students, um, you you hear and you see a lot of things, and you you pick up the basics, give some advice. So who am I not? Um, it's good to get some of the disclaimers out of the way right from the start. So I am definitely not a mental health professional. I'm definitely not a medical professional. I do not have any kind of the relevant degrees, so I do not have a medical doctorate, I do not have a psychology degree, uh, I don't even have any dental experience, right? So none of this is to be construed as professional medical advice. So what kind of advice is it then? So the way to understand the goals of this talk are part of the fact that it's at PLMW. So the goal of this talk is to serve as community mentoring, community education and advice. Right, so these are very different from professional medical advice, but they're also a very valuable supplement because looking after the well being, mentally and physically, of our community is a group effort. Uh, the goal is that it should be an opportunity to learn from experiences from people in your community, such as myself, uh, but it's also an opportunity to see these things talked about in our community, to be able to see each other and to know that you're not alone. And even if I can't be there physically, it is an opportunity to be present for one another. Um, in order to make it even a little bit more of a community thing, throughout the talk, uh, I will be sharing quotes from a bunch of students that I, I asked for, for input. Basically, I asked them for what are some things about mental health they wish they had heard sooner. Um, so it's anonymous, I have their permission, and I just wanted to thank them right from the beginning. Okay, 
And again, um, none of this is medical advice. Just like having that very explicitly in there, okay? So I wanna start out with some of the fundamentals, some of the, the basics about mental health. And to explain this in terms of the programming languages community, um, we care a lot about foundations, right? Uh, in this community, we believe that it is worth spending a lot of time on the basics before we go on to succeed at some more complicated tasks. And so I say this because for some people that have more experience talking about these issues, some of this will be reviewed for some people, but I also know that none of it will be reviewed for everyone in the room. That's why it's so important to talk with these things, to start with these basic things, even if they're coming up again and again in each talk on this subject. Okay? So first of all, the why are we here of it? Um, the simple way to put it is you matter, period. I don't care what ifs, ands, or buts. Um, the people in the community are the community and they are what matters about this community. And so to put this in terms that you might understand um, is in when we think about type systems, what are the two most important lemmas we think about? We think about progress and we think about preservation. And when you are wrapped up, uh, whether in grad school or in any kind of research, any kind of work, uh, it is very easy to get obsessed with progress, to worry if you're doing enough, to worry if you're going at the fastest pace and to really compare yourself with others. And this is a moment to step back and to focus on preservation, meaning that there is no value in doing research if we are not protecting the people that are doing it. And if we're not recognizing that the people behind the work are more valuable than any individual piece of work that gets done. Now, some of the basics that I want to lay out and some of how we're going to talk about these things. So to have a good conversation about mental health, we need to understand that stigma is a fundamental part of any conversation about mental health. Mental health stigma, meaning any sort of sense of shame, guilt, or secrecy around the idea of having a mental illness or having any sort of mental health struggle. And why mental health stigma is so insidious is because it drives people to silence, it drives people away, and it drives people away from all of the different people and resources and communities that have the capacity to help them and to support them. And so even the, the kind of most basic level conversations about mental health, simply by being a conversation, reduces some of that stigma, makes it a valid thing to talk about and helps stop this pattern of driving people away and make, makes it easier and less socially risky for people to seek care. Now, one tool that is very common when talking about stigma and destigmatizing de mental health, but it's a metaphor that I like, is the analogy between mental health and physical health. And so by exploring this metaphor and by exploring these similarities, we can not only reduce some of that stigma, but we can also become more informed about mental health generally. And so a version of this metaphor that I decided to use for this talk is imagine somebody walked up to you and says they have a sharp pain in their chest. Would you encourage them to go to the hospital? They have this chest pain. And hopefully the answer is going to be yes. And the reason is that you cannot know yet what they're dealing with, right? You cannot know whether they're having a heart attack that's going to require severe emergency intervention or where they're having a panic attack, which is something that can be typically treated with less drastic measures. Because you don't know, you need a professional there to help you decide. And once you decide, both of those are going to be things that deserve some kind of professional care, even if there's this different levels of severity. And one of the underlying points that I try and get at when I specifically talk about this metaphor is the idea that mental health is something that is on a spectrum, okay? And my personal experience is that a lot of times when we have these kinds of talks, people are not really spending enough time recognizing that middle point on the spectrum. And so if we were to compare with different levels of physical health person problem have, like problems that people might have, on the one hand, you might have things that are very immediate, very life-threatening emergencies. So the physical version of this would be your heart attacks. Um, typically, the mental health version of this is people that are working specifically on suicide prevention, uh, which is very, very important work, but it's only one part of the story. 
Uh, on the, the far end of this, you get things that might not even be illnesses at all, but that deserve support. So for example, if you're pregnant, you're having a kid, you need to go to a hospital, but that's not an illness. This is something that also gets left out that you do not need to have a mental illness to use these resources. Another one of the groups that gets left out is people that are going to get through, they're going to live, but their quality of life is going to be significantly affected. So imagine you're waking up every single day and you've got a, a lot of back pain every day. You're not going to die from that, but it is a real part of your quality of life. And I like to talk about this middle because that's where I am. And I, in my experience, a lot of people are in that range. And in academia, you get a lot of people who are sticking in that range and not getting the support they should. And the point here is that all of these different levels deserve support, whether you are in an emergency situation, whether you don't even have anything that needs a diagnosis, or whether you're in this middle range like I would be myself. Okay. And so now I want to kind of turn to this and talk about the stigma angle of this analogy. So I want to build on some of the cultural, let's say, development that happened during the height of the COVID pandemic. I think this really made a lot of us reflect on this very basic point that if you have an infectious disease and you are taking time off of your work because you need to treat your infectious disease, typically people are not only going to recognize that you're not being a burden on the community by taking time off to treat that disease, typically there's an understanding you are proactively keeping your community safe by keeping other people from getting infected. And although it's not the same sort of virus situation when you take time to receive mental health care, to do things like self-care, to do things for your own well-being. Now, you might not be keeping people from getting COVID, but you are improving the quality of life for the other people around you. Um, they're going to have a better life for you being at your best. Um, although I just said the word better, Another important thing about this is the idea that illness in general is something that is morally neutral, meaning it's neither something that is makes you a better person or anything that makes you a worse person. And if you think in terms of physical health, just about everyone, almost everyone alive will at some point get ill enough that we require professional care, whether it's heart attacks, cancer, um, any other major disease. They're very serious. They're important, but they are part of life. And similarly, mental health should be viewed as morally neutral. It doesn't make you better, it doesn't make you worse. It is serious, but a fact of life. Okay. And a word that I like to use to, to, to kind of pinpoint this a little bit more is the idea specifically that mental health is not monstrous. And so when I go and I say that it is normal to struggle with some sort of mental health problem, that's not saying it's you know, trivial, it's something that's not worth getting treatment, not at all. But what it means is that it does not make you fundamentally flawed to need this kind of support. Um, in fact, just as it would be very strange if you met a person who went through their entire life and never had to go to a doctor, it, it would actually be very strange if you went through your entire life and you never experienced anything where a therapist and psychiatrist would be of use to you. That would be weird. And in particular, one of the most insidious ways that stigma can operate is that when you have, especially when you have some of the most common mental health problems like mood disorders, there's this isolation component. You get this feeling that nobody has ever gone through the same thing. You get this feeling that nobody understands what you've gone through. And this really drives people away from seeking care. It demotivates them from seeking care. And we are scientists and we should care about data. We should care about truth. Uh, it is objectively false that nobody has gone through comparable things. And to, to back up some of that claims, I want to appeal to two kinds of data. I want to appeal to my own personal story and also just some numeric things. So my story, you know, the misery in the middle is maybe a dramatic way to put that. But what I really mean when I want to share kind of my own stories with the community is that I'm someone who I would describe my mental health experience as chronic, moderate mental illness. Moderate meaning not mild, so but also not the most severe. And so what does this look like in concrete terms of a, of a person's life? Well, I've never attempted suicide. 
But throughout my life, I've had plenty of times where I get suicidal intrusive thoughts. I know they're intrusive, but they're there. Uh, I've never cut myself. I've never bled a lot, but I've self-injured in, in other less risky ways. In fact, I wasn't planning on saying this, but I even self-injured a bit today. Um, I've also never lost a job, never had to quit school because of a mental illness. There were sure times that I wanted to, though, where I regretted being in employment. And I've been in treatment on and off since I was, you know, starting my teenage years. And certainly there have been times where I've, I've wanted to, to quit that process as well. But looking back at somebody who's gotten treatment for so much of my life, I'm just infinitely better off for it. I now feel so much more skilled with the things that are important to me, whether it is dealing with people, dealing with my own feelings, coping with my own disability, coping with social inequality and how that affects me, all these things that I might have once not known how to, to handle in my life, I now know better. And of course, all, all sorts of work-related things as well. So by the numbers, uh, it's, it's important to recognize just how common this kind of thing is. So a few years ago, there was a paper out um, giving rough stats that during your PhD, more than 50% of people are going to qualify for some kind of mental health diagnosis. Most common being your mood disorders, major depression and anxiety. Um, at some of the institutions that I have data for, the peak years of COVID, we also saw up to about 20% of undergraduates self-harming uh, at some point during that period. And so on the one hand, when you look at these data, they are sobering. They tell us that you know, this is a community issue. It is things that an entire community should be looking at together. Uh, but it's also very solid proof that you are not alone. And that is something that is really important to, to hold on to. Now, in the rest of the talk, I want to start and go beyond some of the basics. So that was kind of our foundations. Now to go up to some of the things that aren't quite as often in these talks are a little more detailed. And so we're going to talk about actual models that you could use to, to talk about the psychology of mental health in order to get that deeper understanding and through getting that understanding, uh, we could either make ourselves feel more equipped when we're going into conversations with professionals that are providing care to us, and also make us feel more informed when we're conversing with each other and supporting each other in community, not to replace, but to complement the work of professionals. So one of the, the main model that I like to start with, like all models, it's never perfect, but it's a valuable model is what is called the biopsychosocial model. So that stands for three things, bio, psycho, and social. And what this model tells us is that our health, our well-being, is a function of all of these three aspects of our life. And by seeing our health, and especially our mental health, as a function of these three different things, we can use this to help highlight and organize some of the things you can do for your well-being. What are the different ways you can treat or be treated? So your bio, your biology matters. It could be things like your genes that cannot be changed. But there's a lot of things in here that are changeable, like your physical health, your diet, your sleep. Not only can you change these, these are major influences. Now, psychology, it's a bit reductive to say psychology affects your mental health, but we can get more specific. So we can say that your thought patterns matter and your psychological skills and preparation matter. It is also worth reflecting that this model is, applies to health generally and that absolutely your mental health does influence your physical health in an opposite direction. Uh, last one is that your social relationships, what kind of social supports you have available, and the social context, the situation that you are living in, all of these are major factors in your mental health. Um, they can sometimes even be the biggest one. Now, let's zoom in on this biological component. So to care for your mind, really the foundation for that um, is to care for your body. And so there's a quick checklist here, even if you don't do it now, um, you know, for everyone in the audience, you should go through and you should check this, you know, today. One, are you hydrated? Two, are you consistently sleeping well? The exact amount varies per person, but somewhere in the ballpark of eight hours a day. Do you consistently eat enough food and high enough quality food 
that it nourishes you. Now, poor sleep, I would say, is something um, that is, is known to be common in academic settings. Uh, it's something that people tend to joke about that doesn't make it any less serious. And I would say poor nutrition is something that is almost as common, but it doesn't get talked about as much. And I have seen people's lives literally change when they fix these factors. I've had people have very serious issues and then realize years later how big a part of that their diet was. And some of the student insights that I gathered uh, also agreed on this. Now, the first one was from a student that wasn't engaged in research, so it's about grades, but things like sleep and food are more important than your grades or your paper. Um, things like please get sleep, even if the even if the person who wrote this wasn't doing that consistently, they still knew the importance of it. Okay. So what's that next or second level of, of talking about taking care of your body? So I may get pushback here because computer scientists are not known for being athletes. Uh, but when we talk about exercise and physical activity for mental health, we are really, really not talking about being athletic. You don't have to be one of the people in the programming languages community that goes out and runs marathons or rock climbs or any of that. So my way of doing uh, physical activity for mental health is that I don't own a car. So I walk to campus every day, and that's actually not just um, low physical activity, that is moderate physical activity. Um, and so even if you were to do something like take a walk outside while you're thinking about your research, that is still exercise. It is much more important to pick something that fits into your lifestyle and is the kind of thing you would actually enjoy and actually be consistent with rather than looking for the thing that's most intense. And student comments really lined up with this as well. Um, so people actually specifically calling out, even if it's just walking, it's still very helpful. And that more broadly, mental health and physical health, they are deeply, deeply connected. Either one can cause the other or make the other one worse. So I now want to, to talk about a different part of your biology, which is medicine, medicines that affect your body, medicines that affect your, your biology. This could be medicines for anything from depression and anxiety to stuff like bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, all of that. And I do think it is important to talk about conditions like bipolar and schizophrenia because they often don't get talked about in that surface level. Uh, I've got people that are very close to me um, that are diagnosed bipolar and they're doing fine. They're doing great. It's actually probably one of, it's, it tends to respond quite well to medication. And one of the things that I want to highlight here is that regardless what it's for, medicine can kind of have its own unique stigma. People can worry about, is it going to change who I am? Is it going to fundamentally, you know, make me less myself? Um, most people that I talk to and from most of my own experience, the main thing that people will tell you if they're getting good effects from it um, is that they're probably just more awake or more energetic or a little less sensitive to, you know, things in their environment, that kind of thing that would normally, they, that would normally set them off. But the, the flip side of this that I also try to remind people is that for the large majority of medications, if you try it and you don't like the effects, you don't like how it makes you feel, you can usually just stop and try something else. And I know this because I've been on a lot of different meds over my life, and one of them, uh, I was on Cymbalta at one point, and I actually was experiencing insomnia during that time. Uh, my doctor believed it was totally unrelated to the meds. For all I know, he could be right, but still he respected my right as the patient to say, I want to try a different med. And we did. And I don't know well, what fixed it or when, but, you know, eventually I started sleeping well again. And so, you know, you can you can always change your mind on that. Now, I want to close out the um, the body section with some comic relief from one of the students. Um, so I'm just going to quote this student exchange for four students. Gete vitamin D. I second vitamin D. Uh, this was a largely queer group of people I was talking, so trans with a vitamin D deficiency gang, now making me wonder what the consequences of vitamin D deficiency are. Um, student two comes back and gives you uh, an entire list of symptoms of vitamin D deficiency. Um, bone pain or achiness, thus it was concluded by the group of students that vitamin D is bone healing juice. Um, so 
take all of your vitamins, but be aware of vitamin D deficiency. Go outside is what they're saying. All right, so I now want to go on to this next component, which is the psychological component. And again, um, this can feel a little bit weirdly reductive because this is all psychology. But I really want to focus on psychological like thought patterns and psychological skills. And so one of several major things that people do in therapy is work on developing skills for dealing with your own thought patterns and dealing, dealing with your own emotions and all of that. So one of the most widespread things today would be your cognitive behavioral therapy, your CBT. And so that typically focuses on your relationship between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So you have experiences in the world, you tend to have thoughts, they're usually somewhat automatic responses. The way in which you respond to those thoughts and then creates how you feel about something. The way that you are feeling then guides your behavior. And by inspecting each of these three different components, you can kind of gain increased control over these things. So you can either replace a thought in order to create different feelings, or you can replace a behavior. You can't quite as easily directly replace a feeling. Now, there are really important criticisms of CBT to be made, and I want to give them some time. Uh, it's very incomplete because it is focusing really only on the things that you can fully control inside of your head. And that's valuable to recognize what is and is not within your direct control. But if we never talk about anything that is not 100% inside your own head, inside your own control, then we're really not talking about enough. And so I do want to, to emphasize for anyone who's tried that and not had a good experience with it, there are so many other kinds of skills, kinds of formal therapies and trainings that you can do. So for me, because I'm autistic, one of the things that was probably the most beneficial to me in my own treatment was actually social skills training. Um, because they are skills, they are things you can equip yourself with, and you're going to have a lot less distress in your life if you equip yourself with that skill set. Uh, a thing that I've not, that um, is in one sense, um, so this next one, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT, uh, it is on the one hand, there's a, a very official, very formalized, very structured version on this, but the ideas behind it also make their way into a lot of much broader mental health treatment, even mental health self-care kind of things. So dialectical behavioral therapy was originally developed for borderline personality disorder. Um, which there are some problems with that diagnostic label, but basically it's a condition where you tend to have a lot of emotional regulation problems. And so because of that, really regulation and, and balance is such a major focus. So for example, regulating between extremes of emotions, regulating between uh, extremes in your relationships, or balancing mentally between rational thinking and emotional thinking. Now, if you go to, to a DBT therapist, probably the first thing they're going to expect is they're probably going to expect that a lot of people come in overusing their emotional mind and not relying enough on their rational mind. Within this kind of academic community, my own anecdotal evidence is kind of the experience. We try and rationalize everything. We try and turn everything into rules or make everything certain. And we forget that our emotions, although they're, they're not perfect, have something valid to tell us. Okay. Now, there are a lot of um, other therapies out there that also try to encompass some of the things that CBT misses out more actively. Uh, narrative therapy being an example of one that really focuses on letting you tell your story, rewrite your own narrative. Um, but no matter what you're trying to do, just another one of those kind of fundamental stigma sort of things um, is to remind yourself that a therapist is not there to tell you what to think. Um, one, they're there to listen and to be someone that there's not consequences if you tell them something, um, but also to give you to give you skills and to give you the opportunity to practice those skills. Um, just to reinforce this with an, another comment from a student, you don't need to have a mental illness to have a therapist. They can be useful for anybody. Okay. Now, one that I want to spend probably the biggest chunk of time on is actually going to be the, the social component because it's something that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, society 
in general, is a massive, massive component of your mental health. Um, this takes many different forms. So on the one hand, strong social relationships um, are a major, major factor of your overall health to the point that it, you, know, you see stories of it affecting people's life expectancy even. Not only that, social stressors such as interpersonal stressors, conflicts with people, are some of the most common kind of mental health stressors or triggers that a person can have. Not only that, but your position in the world, your position in society is also a major factor in what kind of challenges you're likely to run into, what kind of resources you're going to have or not have to help you deal with that. And especially we're fo focusing in on this last part, it also tells us that talking about society, social issues, and social advocacy are all things that are fundamentally inextricable from the conversation on our mental health care. Uh, because our state of being healthy or unhealthy is a function of society. Okay, so let's go into a couple different aspects socially to, to keep an eye on. Um, one of the things that is hard that I've struggled with, and I'm going to tell you anyway, because you need to hear it, is that when you feel awful, there is this urge to isolate yourself from everyone else. Um, this is fundamentally, it is a vicious cycle. It is a thing that the more you do it, the worse it's going to get. And the more you find a way to resist that urge, the more you find an alternate path the easier it's going to get, the better you're going to feel. Um, this is one of those hard things to carry out. And so I have tips from my own personal experience. One, if you are not ready to actually be around living, breathing human beings, you got to find a proxy. you got to find something else to make you feel more connected. So if you're doom scrolling on your phone, you know what? Keep photos from a person in your life. Keep messages from someone in your life that just make you feel less connected and make you feel like somebody knows you exist and knows that you matter. Secondly, if you want to reach out for somebody to kind of talk you through those moments where you're feeling awful, it can be really hard to make yourself reach out once you're already in that place because you're going to feel like a burden. And so it can actually be really helpful if you go to someone that you trust and you tell them in advance, I have these times when I'm getting isolated and I need to talk to somebody, can you be one of the people that I talk to? And then you're not going to feel like as much of a burden if you already know that they approved it. Lastly, it is okay to start with light social activities. So it could be as simple as just playing a video game where there's going to be other people in a multiplayer setting and you're not really talking to each other that much. Heck, if you're not ready for people yet, it is fine to just grab a stuffed animal and talk to a stuffed animal. I do the same thing. Okay. Now, this is something that also really lines up with experiences that some of the students had. This one is from one of the grad students in the group. When things start to spiral, you might feel tempted to avoid people. This is often caused by shame, pressure to work, other things like that. Don't do this. It will make things worse. Don't cancel your meeting with your advisor. Go to it no matter what's happened. You need to talk to them. You need to talk with your friends, talk with your acquaintances. Avoiding people and isolating makes things worse. And just on a personal level, I want to back this up as someone who is an advisor. When I'm advising PhD students, I tell them, I will not worry when you are showing up and telling me you had an unproductive week. The time that I'm really going to worry about you is when you're not showing up at all. And their, their comment is also consistent with some of the ideas that get taught about in these different therapies. So in dialectical behavioral ther therapy, there's this idea of opposite emotion action. So when we get some of these strong, painful emotions, um, those emotions will often push us towards self-destructive behavior, and we need to, to plan ahead and actually practice moving in some other more constructive direction when that happens. Now, I don't know if we're going to read through all of the fine print on this one, but we also got a lot of good student comments specific to students' relationships with their work. So, um, just I'll read through the, the first three and then you can you can read the fourth one on the slides if you want to. Figuring out bandwidth is important. Everyone's bandwidth is important and you don't need to do it all. I like that they recognize that it's not the same because it's so easy to compare yourself to other people and you do not need to be number one in everything all the time. 
Second, asking for help is not shameful, so don't be afraid to do it before things get disastrous. This is another thing that lines up with my advising experience. Um, our job is infinitely harder if we don't know what you need. So please make our job easy by telling us what you need. And thirdly, again, this is an undergrad, so grades don't determine your worth. Uh, publications also determine your worth. Citations don't determine your worth. Okay, um, you are valuable by being alive, even if that doesn't connect with you right now. Okay, now as an advisor, I also want to talk to the other advisors in the room. Uh, as, as a community, we need to collectively recognize that there needs to be a, a baseline expectation of supportive mentorship. That is a requirement for doing this job. Um, one of the biggest things that affects a person's mental health is their choice of supervisor. And so we need to set high standards. What does that look like? Never demand a workload that's so high that it's going to violate their fundamental biopsychosocial needs. That includes wanting to go and do things with friends and not work every waking minute of your life. Uh, do not engage in emotional neglect, manipulation, power harassment, those kind of things. Um, do recognize that every working relationship is also an interpersonal relationship. Um, now, I, I frame this as, as emotional regulation, but what I really mean um, is you're going to have times when a mentee is presenting some kind of their anxiety to you. Uh, within reason, part of your job in that relationship is to respond to that in a reasonably supportive way. And overall, do not confuse cruelty for rigor. Um, the nice advisors are just as good at math as everybody else. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the value of having different kinds of social supports. And this is something where I really want to make sure to emphasize you do not have to be the most popular person in the room. You do not have to be the life of the party. Uh, as an autistic person, I recognize there's a whole lot of autistic people in this community or people that otherwise struggle with social skills. It's not about being popular. It's not about the quantity of your relationships. It is all about the quality of your relationships. Having people in your life uh, that you can trust, that, that value you and, and want you to succeed. And on the one hand, of course, some of these frequently do come from academics, do come from, from work and all of that. But there are values to having other people outside of that. For one thing, if you're really mad about school, it can be easy to go to those people. Uh, secondly, it breaks up the monotony about like, thinking about one thing all day, perhaps for years on end. Um, and they can help remind you the, the value of being a full person and letting yourself have multiple interests. Okay, um, this is, we're slowly, finishing up the, the kind of self-care section of the talk. And as we do this, I want to make sure just to reinforce uh, what realistic expectations look like. So when I talk about things that you can do in your own life, I am not at all, not at all saying, oh, you just need to exercise and eat better and your depression will be cured. Because if maintaining healthy life habits were enough to fix everyone's mental health problems, we would not have psychiatric medication, we would not have therapists, we would not have psychiatrists. What I'm saying is that even if you develop a habit and that habit makes your life 5% better, uh, that's something that was already worth the effort. I'm also saying that these good habits can add up. So if you make three or four different life changes, that's not going to cure you, but that could be a thing that gives you the energy to take those bigger steps, to do those kind of things that will eventually in the long term get you to where you need to be. So don't underestimate the importance of the things that you can do. Now, I'm going to get into some of the, the heavier stuff here, and I want to talk specifically about a model of mental health called the minority stress model. And the minority stress model theorizes that minority groups face unique stressors, and that despite our capacity for unique ways of coping, we face an increased mental health burden because of this. This was initially developed in the context of lesbian mental health issues. Uh, it also generalizes to LGBT groups specifically. It's also very well studied and generalizes very well for racial minorities. It is reasonable to explore this for other groups as well. And when we talk about marginalization, it's important to take a moment to recognize the uncomfortable fact that academia is not better. We are not a, an ivory tower that is isolated from the world. Uh, I'm not shy about the fact that when I transitioned, I completely lost my relationship with my then, well, my previous, uh, I graduated by that, but my PhD advisor. 
And I talk to other trans people in academia, and I'm the lucky one. I know multiple people that have had even more dramatic losses of their primary supervisor, the primary mentor. And that's a very real stressor. Not only that, but much of the world, certainly the United States at this time, uh, is physically unsafe uh, for a number of different minority groups much of the time. And to simply exist your entire day uh, in that space uh, is a substantial stressor. And I know this because a few weeks ago, I recently um, visited a country that was physically safe and where I had a number of very supportive collaborators. And I gave a talk while I was there, and it was the best talk that I had given in probably a year um, because I just felt like myself for the first time in a long time when I did that. And so speaking again to senior people in the room, uh, we can't look away. So if we want people to be well, be healthy in this community, we need to be advocating for the right of everybody to exist in this space without prejudice, without exclusion. Uh, that is actually part of, of community care. And to kind of close out this section on minority stress, I want to take a minute to focus in on international student minority stress. So I don't have a view of the room. I don't know how many international students are in the room. Um, it's something where I don't personally have that lived experience, but it's something I feel shouldn't go unmentioned. So when you look at international students as a population, you are disproportionately affected by stressors like poverty, so economic issues, isolation from support networks that other people might have, power harassment, so abuse by supervisors, um, stresses related to language barriers, culture barriers, all sorts of other stresses. And so at the same time, you're often not given the same level of resources. You may be in a new country and never actually taught about how to navigate the system there nor how to navigate your rights. So for example, only while I was doing this research did I actually learn that if you are having a language barrier, um, there are many cases where you get a legal right to a medical translator. Um, and even when you're doing self-care, there are a lot of community groups out there that take the time to translate written mental health resources, take advantage of that. Uh, you also have the right to culturally competent care, somebody who understands um, the background you're coming from. Now, not everybody's going to be like that, but if you go to some of the major search engines for therapists like Psychology Today, you can look what languages do they speak, what groups of patients do they serve the most. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk about um, the, the reality of, of kind of abuse of power. Um, if a person in a position of power tells you that you need to stay silent about mental health, or that you need to not seek mental health care um, because they're, they're pretending that it's going to have an act, uh, effect on your visa status when it won't. That's not how that works. Uh, that's abusive behavior. They're manipulating you. That is not an acceptable thing to tell a person. Okay, um, so reflecting on some of the stuff about culture and care. Uh, every person deserves, deserves to be healthy. That does not mean that health needs to look the same for every person. Um, and I want to recognize this because when there is a history of care not being culturally competent, it can at times get this unhelpful idea of therapy being a thing that is just for white people. And this hurts people of color because everyone deserves having access to this resource. And in particular, because social things like relationships with people are such a huge part of mental health, you specifically deserve under someone who understands how those relationships function in the culture that you live within. Uh, at the same time, it is okay for you to pick and choose what kinds of care feel best for you, feel like your top priority, if some of those resonate with you more culturally than others. Okay, um, I have a couple comments in here, one from an Indian student, um, one uh, from, I think, a Chinese American student, just talking about some of the unique stigma issues they were facing. Um, so, one student had an entire, their entire family has diagnoses. Uh, I think one of them might even work in the industry, um, but they still don't believe in psychiatry. Or if they do, they believe that it's only for people that are lesser. So there's still this idea of stigma underlying it. Um, or people just simply not believing in therapy or not believing in mental health care at all. If, if you ever are dealing with this, I just want to have these slides here to know that you're not the first person that's gone through that. So to, to kind of summarize and move towards the conclusion of the talk, because I know you've had a long session, 
Um, so we talked about a lot of the things that you can actually do under the biopsychosocial section, but let's talk about some of the things at more of a community level. Uh, social connection is fundamental. Workshops like this can be a great place to connect, but also organizing around mental health is very impactful. You can share stories, share resources, share coping strengths. And one thing I think the PL research community does very well is we have very strong mentoring programs. So let's build on that for the sake of our wellness. Uh, second thing I think is very important is the issue of student workers' rights. So overwork, uh, abuse by supervisors, poverty are major, major stressors for many student workers. And so we need to actively protect people's right to live free of that. Um, I've met many, many student workers who cannot afford mental health care because they are underpaid by the institution that gave them their mental illness. Uh, living wage is essential and the right to treatment without co-pays is essential. Um, minority safety in particular is essential. Uh, I know there's some people in the room that this will already resonate with. PLDI was recently hosted in Florida. Uh, it was hosted in Florida several weeks before it became de facto illegal for, for some members of our community to exist in public in Florida. Not only does this create stress associated with physical safety and any kind of career consequences of non-attendance, um, but it actually increases this feeling of isolation as well. Uh, I had people in my own hallway um, who saw I happened to be traveling around that time and they asked, oh, are you going to this conference? And to, to know that the person sitting right next to me does not even know that this is a factor I have to account for in my life was very isolating. And so um, this is actually the last slide of the talk. And just to conclude, um, safety for all groups is, is a very important part of uh, community care. And I'll stop it there. Um, I don't think questions are a thing for this talk, but I'll stick around just in case I need we, to do anything. Yeah, we can take uh, we can take a few.